accused, will you stand? Your surname and Christian name? Altmar and Klaus. Date and place of birth? 25th of October 1913 in Bad Gottesberg. Profession? Businessman. What was your address at the time of your arrest in La Paz? Edificio San Juan, Avenida Arthur. What was your father's name? Niklaus Barbie. What was your mother's name? Anna Hesse. You say your name is Altman. Since when? I was naturalized on the 3rd of October 1957 in Bolivia under both names, Klaus Altmann and Klaus Barbie. Right. Thank you. You may sit. The clerk of the court will now read out the indictment. Klaus Barbie is hereby accused of having in 1943, in Lyon and elsewhere on French territory, committed crimes against humanity by aiding and abetting a concerted plan to bring about the deportation, enslavement and extermination of civilian populations, or persecution on grounds of politics, race, or religion by deporting to concentration... This was the scene at the Assize Court in Lyon on the first day of the trial of the man who had been head of the Gestapo there for two years during the Second World War. In the 1950s, Barbie was twice sentenced to death in his absence for war crimes, but under French law, these convictions were annulled after 20 years. He can still, however, be prosecuted for crimes against humanity. In this case, atrocities against Jews and the resistance. These are the charges now being read out. Kidnapping or having kidnapped, taken away... As well as facing charges from the public prosecutor, Barbie is also being sued for symbolic damages by over a hundred individuals and many associations represented by these lawyers. French television cameras are in court, but since the official recording of the trial will not be made public for 50 years, the BBC obtained special permission for a team of shorthand writers to take down what was said each day. These transcripts, edited and translated, form the basis for this dramatized reconstruction. In the trial itself, some of those who gave evidence, including Barbie, spoke through an interpreter. Here, they speak directly. And it is hereby ordered that Klaus Barbie, born on the 25th of October, 1913, son of Nicholas Barbie and Anna Hesse, calling himself a businessman and living in La Paz with no known address in France, be accused of the crimes detailed above. Oh. I shall now begin the examination of the accused. You were born on the 25th of October, 1913, at Trier, near Bonn. Yes. You went to school in Trier and joined the Hitler Youth in 1933, is that right? Yes. You joined the Nazi Party in 1935. Correct. You go to a training school, do your military service, you are promoted to sub-lieutenant. Now, that was after I took my exams. What sort of exams? Medical, general knowledge, purity of race? It was the examination for sub-lieutenant of the SS. <laughs> you are married in Dusseldorf on the 25th of April, 1940, and a daughter is born in Trier on June 30th, 1941. Correct. You arrived in Lyon on November 15th, 1942, and you remained until August 1944. Correct. You received military decorations, and there is also a personal letter from Himmler, dated September 18th, 1943, congratulating you on your devotion to countering the French resistance. Is this correct? Correct. Did you have any doubts at all about the Nazi Party at this time? Yes. Our party's full name is the National Socialist Workers' Party. For me, socialism means comradeship. But some party leaders, like Bormann, used their position to make themselves rich. They betrayed the ideal of cumbridgeship. Is that the only ideal your leaders betrayed? No. There are many other things that I could add, but that is all in the past. You have to face reality. The war is over. Germany lost the war. Well, after the war, you managed to escape the attentions of the occupying forces, and then in 1947, an American agent called Robert Taylor recruited you to help the American army in its fight against communism. And for this, you were allowed to live with your family. Is that right? I only agreed to work for them because they had kidnapped my son, who has since died. So your collaboration with the Americans continued until 1951, when they decided to help you emigrate to South America under the name of Altman. You arrived in Bolivia on the 25th of April, 1951. Correct. You were naturalized a Bolivian under the name of Altman in 1957, is that correct? Yes. From 1951 to 1972, 
You devoted yourself to your family and to commerce. Correct. And then your real identity was discovered. Yes, when the wife of Mate Klaasfeld arrived in 1972. France then demanded your extradition and it was refused. Yes, I was examined by an attorney and I told him that I was formerly Klaas Barbie. The Supreme Court confirmed my naturalization because it had been taken out in two names. Altman and Barbie. That was on the 28th of October, 1973. Can you tell us to what extent you were involved in the political life of Bolivia? Not at all. I think it best in a foreign country not to become involved politically. At the beginning of 1983, you were expelled by the Bolivian authorities, and on 5th of February 1983, you land at Cayenne. You are arrested by the French police and transferred to Lyon. Now, do you agree with these facts? No, I do not agree. The extradition is not legally valid. It is an infringement of Bolivian law, national law, and international law. I consider myself a hostage, not a prisoner. Mr. President, I wish to read a statement. Is it long? No. Very well, go ahead. I want to say to the judges and jurors of this court that I am detained here illegally. I was kidnapped from Bolivia and the matter is now under consideration by the Bolivian Supreme Court. Despite the respect I have for the court, I repeat that I am a citizen of Bolivia. I am only here because I was illegally expelled and I no longer intend to appear before this tribunal. And I ask you, Monsieur le Président, to return me to St. Joseph's prison. I have a lawyer. And in spite of the climate of vengeance and the lynching campaign being carried out by the French media, I will leave my defense with my lawyer and ask him to fight for honor and justice. Quiet. The declaration finished. Yes. If I understand, you are refusing to appear before the Assize Court from this point on. Correct. I, I am amazed that in the middle of his examination, the accused should read out a statement, which isn't even his, but has been prepared by his lawyer. Klaus Barbie is mocking justice, as he's been doing for years. 43 years ago, that man's victims couldn't say, I'm going back to my cell, do as you want. Barbie has been given the chance to account for himself in a calm and reasonable atmosphere. Instead, he has decided to become Mr. No, Herr Nein. Monsieur le Président, we have before us a Nazi. A Nazi who is no longer triumphant. A Nazi who sits there cowering, afraid to look his past in the face. <laughs> Any further disturbance, and I shall empty the court. I speak here without hate and without vengeance. At 17 years of age, I was tortured by the Gestapo in Strasbourg and sent to a concentration camp. I wish you could have the courage to face those who were your victims. I wish you could have the courage to answer them and look them in the eyes. Now, you wish to leave this court because you dare not look me in the eyes and justify the tortures you have committed. I say this to you now without hatred. You are a coward. Please, please, we are not in a theater. Monsieur le Président, such impassioned speeches are unworthy of this court. It is only too easy for the self-righteous to vent their indignation on a single man. Well, I have the honor to defend this man. A defeated enemy at the mercy of a lynch mob. I will have nothing to do with those who howl with the wolves. You have the honor to defend a single man. I represent six million ghosts, none of whom have the good fortune to be standing here today. Do you insist that you will not appear before this court again? Yes, but purely on legal grounds, nothing to do with cowardice. If the accused wishes to withdraw from the trial, does he still want the witnesses he has summoned to appear? Yes. The witnesses may be called, the trial can be held, but I will not be here. The court notes that Klaus Barbie's refusal to appear is unwarranted and orders that the trial shall proceed in his absence. We now come to the first charge on the indictment. On the 9th of February, 1943, there was a raid by the German police on the headquarters of the UGIF, the Union of French Jews in the Rue Saint Catherine in Lyon. By the end of the day, 86 people had been taken to the prison at Montluc. One person was tortured to death and another escaped. Of the 84 left, many were deported to Auschwitz. 
The question to be answered is, was Barbie responsible or not for the raid? Sealed document number one is a typed report dated the 11th of February 1943 and signed apparently Barbie. But the contents of this report can be read in translation on the back of your files. The accused maintains the report was written by a clerk. On March 5th, 1984, Barbie was shown the original and he said, it's possibly my signature, but I'm not sure. Will you give your full name, age, profession, and address? Sulape, Victor, born 19th of October, 1921, pensioner, living 21, Rue Marceau, joinville le Did you know the accused, Klaus Barbie, before the period with which he is now charged? No. You have no kinship with him? No. Make your statement. We are listening. It's not easy. I have to go back 43 years. I was working with my elder brother in the UGIF. The center was well known for helping fellow Jews in need. And that morning, we'd only just arrived when suddenly people in civilian dress burst in, shouting, on the hop, hands up, stand to one side. We realized straight away, of course, what was happening. The Gestapo. Everybody who came in was caught. Anyone who tried to leave was brought back by force. My brother was with me, and I can't for the life of me understand why, but he kept his real identity card. I had mine in the name of Francois Victor Sordier. I, I made a sign to him that we were not to show that we were brothers. They took my papers from me and put me to stand with two or three others with non-Jewish identity cards, and eventually they let me go. I went straight to a post office and sent a telegram, Mr. Payne has come to UGIF, tell everybody. My brother was sent to Auschwitz with everything that that means. During the time you were inside, was anyone else released? Yes, a man called Schrager, who has since died. And later, I remember hearing that Monsieur Thomas and Madame Eva Gottlieb had been released. Questions? First of all, I want to say I find the testimony of this witness confused. Did he recognize Monsieur Thomas at the UGIF? I'm not very Monsieur good. Monsieur Sulepe, will you speak into the microphone? I'm not very good at faces. No, I don't recall Monsieur Thomas. But Schrager, yes, because I saw him afterwards. Thank you. You may step down. Bring in the next witness, please. My name is... Michel Thomas, 73 years of age. Uh, I'm a director of several language schools. I live in New York, and I'm now an American citizen. Make your deposition. We are listening. In 1943, I was in Lyon, active in the resistance. I asked the director of the UGIF for permission to recruit some young people for active service in the resistance. The Jewish leaders violently opposed this. They said theirs was an official organization. <laughs> And moreover, uh, they didn't want to separate the young ones from their families. So I went to the center on February 9th to talk to people individually. I knew there was a food distribution. As I went up the stairs, for the first time in my life, I had a premonition of evil. But I still went in. And there a hand grabbed me and I was caught. I pretended to not understand German, and finally they took me into a big room. There were people all over the place, and uh, behind a table there was a man in civilian dress. I had some paintings uh, with me. My cover was as an artist, so I just said that I'd come to the wrong address. Uh, I was in front of Barbie for an hour and a half. And when you find yourself face to face with that angel of death, you don't forget that cynical smile, those rat eyes, his crooked little finger. So I beg you, Monsieur le Président, bring him back here so we can see. Under what circumstances were you released? Barbie believed my story. You said that you were grabbed. By whom? By the Gestapo. In uniform? Oh, well, Barbie was in civilian dress. What makes you think it was Barbie you were dealing with behind that table? Well, in uh, 1972, in the United States, I saw his photo in Time magazine. My blood froze. 
Now, you might ask, uh, how can I be sure after 40 years? But uh, to have been face to face, you, you know, you know. Um, I hate to rupture the charm of this testimony, but I have a more down to earth question to ask. The witness says he knew that there was a food distribution that day. I'd like to know who told him that. People I knew told me. Well, just now, I did have a witness who could remember at least one name. Through whom was he told there was a distribution that day? I'd like to put a question to Monsieur Vergès if he can remember the name of people that he saw on the street or in a cafe four years ago. I'd be very impressed. You can't give a precise name. Well, uh, even if I could, I wouldn't. <laughs> Second question. In the room at the center, there were a hundred men and women. Now I have reread the witness's testimony. He paid attention to them, worried in case one of them might give him away. Now from those 100 persons, can he give me one or two names? That's the same question, Monsieur le Président. You can't remember the names. But, uh, even if I could, they're not important. I repeat, I, I knew people. I didn't arrive there as someone totally unknown. I recognized uh, Monsieur Sulape, who I think was here today. Monsieur le Président, allow me to point out for the first time the witness has answered the question by giving me the name of Monsieur Sulape, a man with whom he has just spent four hours locked up in a witness room. But Monsieur Sulape cannot remember having met Monsieur Thomas. Make your deposition, Madame Levy. We are listening. I was employed as social assistant at the Jewish Center. On that day, in the beginning of the afternoon, three men walked in, in civilian dress, raincoats and hats. People were brought in one after another and nobody could leave. Eventually, we were taken to Drancy, outside Paris. There were hundreds of us, men, women, and children. On the 25th of March, I wrote to my family because we knew that we were going to be deported. But for some reason, I was taken out of the group. I want to say this, that I have this memory always this image of young women, young girls, and then there was Mr. Weissman and the office boy from the Jewish Center. They left with such courage. They were noble. <laughs> Madame, we understand your emotion. I want to say that the work we did at the UGIF, we did to save people. I want to link with my testimony all those who didn't come back. He was informed that failing his appearance, the president of the Assize Court had the power to order that he be brought in by the court authorities and placed in the dock. The accused replied, I will not appear, and signed Klaus Altman. Monsieur le Président, we ask you to use your discretionary powers to force Barbie to appear. We ask this dispassionately and with complete respect. The defense has every right, except the right to prevent the course of justice. I'm glad to see that Maitre Vergès agrees with me. Every time I see Maitre Vergès smile, it makes me happy. This trial must be the trial of the whole truth, and not just the truth already widely established from piles of documents or the numerous inquiries. We are talking of another truth, the truth of confrontation of exchanged looks, of Barbie's presence, and of the simple human truth that can be read in the eyes of the survivors. Whether their torture was inflicted on them by Barbie, does he show the slightest remorse? Is he capable of looking his victims in the eye? I wish to mention an historical precedent, Eichmann, Klaus Barbie's chief, the author of The Final Solution. He was kidnapped in Argentina, taken to Israel, and Argentina protested. Bolivia hasn't protested, as far as I know. <laughs> At least Eichmann had the courage to stand before his judges. Why can't Barbie? 
The spokesmen for the Parti Civil want their revenge by imposing upon your court alien practices. But this is not Israel, this is France. Home of the rights of man. If Altman is brought back here by force, that would be a lynching. Monsieur le Président, your decision is of the utmost importance. We are being asked to abandon the liberal traditions of France just to align ourselves with other nations. The court again notes that Klaus Barbie's refusal is unwarranted and orders that the trial shall proceed in his absence. We shall now turn to the cases brought against Klaus Barbie by individuals. Call Madame La Selve. Sit on the chair, madame. When I have finished, Monsieur le Président. Will you give your surname, Christian name, age, profession, and address? La Sèvre, Lisa, 86, no profession. Did you know the accused Klaus Barbie before the period with which he's now charged? No. You have no kinship with him? None. Make your deposition, we are listening. I was arrested in 44 by the Barbie team, three savages. I was taken to Montluc. Next morning at 10, I met Barbie. They told me about this gentleman, always with his cosh. When he'd no one to hit, he hit the furniture or his boots. At midday, I was tortured by special handcuffs. Every time they asked me a question, they tightened the cuffs to make me answer. I thought my nails would come out of my fingers. I was strung up by the wrists. That cut my breathing. Each time, I fainted. Then Barbie said, we've been looking for your husband and your son. In front of them, you'll talk. At night, I was put in irons, but my jailer took pity on me and undid my chains. A soldier, not SS. I have to say there were those who took pity on the tortured. Barbie had a whip with a spiked metal ball on the end, controlled by a spring. That he used to butcher my back. And all the time, Monsieur le Président, he was drinking beer mixed with rum. When I came to, I was in an elegant apartment. Barbie was kneeling beside me. He said I was very brave. He listed names of Mackizards I knew very well. I've lost my thread. You were saying that Barbie knelt beside you. Oh, yes. I said I didn't know them. He went mad. He said to the three savages, get her out of here. I don't want to see her again. Get rid of that. That was me. They ended up not knowing what they were doing. I ended up in the infirmary for 10 days, and then I was deported. What became of your husband and son? Jean-Pierre was in the same convoy as me. He was shot. My husband died of typhus in Dakar. Will you give your full name, age, profession and address? Frossard, André, writer. I live in Paris. What is your age? 72. Do you swear without hate or fear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Raise your right hand and say I swear. I swear. Make your statement. We are listening. I was interned in the Jewish huts at Montluc from the 10th of the 12th, 43, to the 16th of the 8th, 44. That's where I learned what crime against humanity meant. For me, crime against humanity means to kill a person for the simple reason he was born. He has no right to exist. But before he dies, it is also necessary that he should be humiliated and his person degraded. That is why this trial is so important. It doesn't matter that Barbie isn't here. He, he's not a major person. It's important because for the first time, a tribunal is looking into the concept of crime against humanity. Up until now, it's been a question of calling them war crimes or genocide. I know how the Barbies were made. Generally, they were mediocrities who had surrendered their conscience to the party. And in exchange, the party gave them the power of life or death over others. A power they would never have had otherwise. 
but they never rediscovered their conscience. Ah, they gave it to Hitler. Uh, Monsieur Frossard knows for what personal reasons I hold him in high regard. In his writings, he has condemned the torture in Algeria. Do you therefore think the French have the right to condemn the Gestapo? Monsieur La Défense, I have written very fully. When one country can only maintain its presence in another by force, then that is the moment history tells them they should get out. It's true. We've committed atrocities. All nations have at one time or another committed war crimes, and I've denounced them. But one cannot equate Algeria with the systematic planning that went into the annihilation of a whole people, a race. That's what I call a crime against humanity. We are listening, Madame Lagrange. I was arrested on the 6th of June, 1944, D-Day, denounced by a French woman. I was 13. We were put into a big beige colored office, my father facing one wall, my mother another, and me a third. After a quarter of an hour, Barbie came in, dressed in gray. You know the details that stay with a 13-year-old. He was carrying a cat. I thought, a man like that couldn't be evil. He stroked my cheek. He told me I was pretty. He asked my mother if she had any more children. She said, two, they're in the country. He played with my hair. Then he slapped me. When my father tried to do something, they pushed a gun into his stomach. This went on for about half an hour. Then they took us to Monluc. The next day, when my mother still couldn't tell them where the other children were, he took me off. And he asked me the same question. He had a smile, thin as a knife. He hit me, kicked me, smashed my face with his fists right on the wounds that had hardly closed from the day before. All oh, my hair was matted with blood. Then he showed me to my mother and he said to her, look what you're doing to your little girl. My mother was in a worse state than me, but she couldn't give him the address. It lasted a week. They put me in a different cell and my mother thought I was dead. June 23rd, 1944 was a day of sheer happiness because they sent us to Drancy together. Then they sent us to Auschwitz. Every morning in the compartment, there were new dead bodies. It was sad, but one was relieved. There was more space. Oh, it's a terrible thing to say. It was the beginning of madness. I stayed in Auschwitz with my mother until August the 23rd, 1944, the day of the liberation of Paris. That was the day of my mother's death. She was gassed. My father was deported August 11th, 1944, on the convoy. 19th of January, 1945, I was in Upper Silesia. It was freezing, minus 30, minus 35. We had nothing to wear and nothing to eat. I saw a column of men and I realized one of them was my father. It's very hard to speak of this because my brother and sister are in the court and it's going to hurt them. A German soldier said, uh, is that your father? I said, yes. He said, well, why don't you go and give him a kiss then? So he called my father over and just when he was going to kiss me, they told him to kneel down and they put a bullet into his head. When I was making my deposition, I was confronted with Barbie. My lawyers will tell you. I said, if I had the slightest doubt, I would withdraw my action. I also said if Barbie showed remorse, 
because of age, I would withdraw. Barbie showed not the least bit of remorse. Not once did he lower his eyes, and I tell you, nor did I. Barbie was as contemptuous as ever, and he was smiling when he said, Madame, the reason I am looking at you is because after seven months in prison, it feels good to look at an appetizing woman again. Monsieur le Président, that man who sent my mother to the ovens wanted to joke with me. Um, do you remember the convoy which took you to Auschwitz? Yes, it was number 76. Madame Lagrange, did you know that the children from the Jewish colony of Isieux were also on it? No, sir, not then. Defense? I don't want to speak to you, and I certainly couldn't answer any questions from Monsieur Vergès. I have no wish to compel the party civil to speak, but if she would like to go on talking... Uh, please, no theatricals. Monsieur Margain, do you swear without hate or fear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Raise your right hand and say, I swear. I swear. Make your deposition. We are listening. I was arrested as a member of the resistance in the Jura, and on the 3rd of May, 1944, was taken to the École de Santé Militaire in Lyon. The same afternoon, I was brought up from the cells and met Barbie for the first time. He didn't hit me, but his team did, for seven days and seven nights. I suffered atrocious injuries. Then Barbie went completely berserk. He smashed me with a padlock and chain and said, all right, you haven't said anything. Well, that doesn't matter. You'll be nacht und nebel, night and fog. No one will ever know what became of you. Later, I was transferred to Compiègne, then to Dachau, then to Buchenwald. There, the Germans made us bury our own. We did it because we wanted to try and mark the place so we could identify them later. But after the liberation, we couldn't. It was a common grave. Most of them were in a terrible state. Of the 2,400 from the Rhone Alps who went from Mont Luc, about 100 came back. Personally, I regret Barbie isn't here for me to have confronted him personally. How did you find out it was Barbie you were dealing with at the Ecole de Santé? Barbie was present at all seven torture sessions. I'll recognize him all my life. No problem. Could we have the next witness, please? The court thanks you for having come. Will you give your full name, age, profession, and address? My name is Mario Bladon. I was born 19th of June, 1923. I live in the Isère. I'm retired. Monsieur le Président, there is a serious problem, and every question turns on it. How can we be sure Barbie was responsible? There are those who knew they were dealing with Barbie at the time. There are others who only saw him once, very quickly, and have recognized him 40 years after. And as a result, their testimonies are much more fragile, as for example, in the case of Michel Thomas. But there are those who, having been tortured for several hours, have the memory of him stamped on their minds, yet have not been confronted with him. Surely, when force is lawful, even necessary, it must be applied. If there isn't a precedent, perhaps we should create one. Barbie is the indispensable witness in this trial. If you tolerate his absence, you're willingly prolonging the sufferings of his victims. Sufferings that can only be eased by seeing them thrown in the face of their torture. If I may. The symbol of this trial is that Nazism hates the light and skulks in the shadows. It is not Barbie's presence that matters, but that of his victims. However, we are now about to hear a second case where confrontation is necessary. I therefore suggest that we confront these witnesses with Barbie, even if it means bringing him here by force. The torturer must face his victims so that they can recognize him. There is a serious problem here, the problem of what separates a totalitarian state from one where rights exist. Among them, the right to remain silent, the right to stay away. Today, as an exception, you want to bring Altman back here so that the witnesses can recognize him. 
an exception of such importance that my learned friend wants to make it the rule, even admitting there's no precedent. Walk, stand. Be seated. Bring in the accused. Monsieur Magen, please. morning. We took the oath yesterday, so there's no need to repeat it again today. Now, you've already told the court that you were beaten with a cosh and a padlock and chain by the accused. Does the face of the accused mean anything to you? I recognize him. I'm absolutely certain. After 40 years, what is it that makes you sure? There's no mistaking that smile. It's not a common face, and I was before him many times. He didn't look like a German. Most of them were big and blonde. I can't be wrong. Accused, you've heard this man claim to have been summoned before you on several occasions and to have been coshed. I wish to say I'm here illegally. I haven't given it. you permission to read anything out, nor have you sought it. I've asked you a question. Will you please answer? I must make a declaration first. I wish to say I am here illegally following my kidnapping and have been brought here by force. Since in juridical terms I am absent, I will not answer. You refuse to answer the questions put to you by the Assize Court President? Yes, I will not answer. Do you recognize the accused? That face. Monsieur. Monsieur le President. I wish to look him in the eyes. Those icy eyes. That mouth. Do you recognize the accused as the man who tortured you? Absolutely. And I resent anyone calling him Altman. Has the accused anything to say? Nothing. Take away his uniform and his coshes, and there's nothing but the coward left. Quiet. <laughs> the second raid with which the accused is charged is the raid on the 6th of April 1944 by the Gestapo on the home for Jewish children at his youth. Forty-four children and five of the staff die in the gas chambers. There is a document well known under the description, the Telex of Isieux, upon which rests the weight of accusation that Barbie originated the events. It is document number four, and I'm going to ask the clerk to read out a translation of the Telex. Service Telex, Lyon, number 5269, 64 stroke 44, subject home of the Jewish children, that is year N, file none. This morning, we flushed out the home for Jewish children at his year N. In total, 41 children aged between 3 and 13 were apprehended. We succeeded also in arresting the whole Jewish staff, numbering 10, five of them women. No cash was found or objects of value. The forwarding to Drossy will take place on the 7th of the 4th, 44, the office of SIPO, Security Police, and of the SS, Information Service, at Lyon. 4B, 61 stroke 43, by order Lieutenant S.S. Barbie, Obersturmführer. I have here the original for anyone who wishes to see it. Please. Uh, may I see this without the plastic cover? Hmm? Yes, Clark, do you have anything to remove it? I'm afraid, Major Vergez, we have nothing to remove it with. Uh, well, allow me, I'll try to... Look, this is preposterous. Yes. I do not want that document opened by Maître Vergès. He is capable of damaging it and then denying its authenticity. Uh, pass it to me, Maître Vergès. Uh, Monsieur le Président, I deeply regret that Maître Klaasfeld has insulted a fellow member of the bar. Uh, Maître Vergès, of course, we had the utmost confidence in you. Thank you, sir. What are your duties in Germany, Herr Streim? I head the German Central Department of Justice concerned with the hunt for war criminals. You have in your hand the Isu Telex of the 6th of April, 1944. What have you to say concerning the facts in this case and the elements of proof? Uh, we have a section dealing with Nazi crimes committed in France. 
And in our files, we came across a copy of this Esoteric. The copy has been used in other trials, and all objections raised against it have been refuted. It is practically certain, therefore, that this document is authentic. And what about the date stamp? Uh, the date is in French and not in German, but that is because it was customary to use office equipment available in occupied zones. The name, could Barbie's name have been used by any other person? No, it was categorically forbidden. Was the issue affair the result of a local initiative? Yes, I think it was. The proof lies in the telex, in the abbreviation at the end, IA, which stands for Im Auftrag, by order of Klaus Barbie. Barbie was the head of section four of the Gestapo. Yes. And there was a subsection 4B dealing with anti-Jewish measures. Yes. Could the head of subsection 4B act independently of the head of the section? No. We shall hear evidence that the children were taken away by an army unit accompanied by three apparent civilians. In no way could it have been an army operation. It was the Gestapo. Herr Streim, please turn to the back of the document. Now, you say that this document is authentic. How do you explain that on the back there is a map of England? It's quite simple. The document is dated the 7th of April, 1944. There was an acute paper shortage at that time. The invasion of Britain had been abandoned, and map paper was used to stick the telex strips onto. What is your name, age, profession, and address? My name is Abina Zlata, born 1907, in oh. Warsaw. Madam? Please make your deposition. Tell us everything. We are listening. On 10th of May, 1940, I enrolled as a military nurse in the French Red Cross. I'd heard of camps where Jewish children were regrouped. And I went to the office of Home for Children and asked to go to any camp and give whatever help I could. I chose the frailest, and rehoused them at his year. On that Thursday, April 6, 1944, I was away in Montpellier, looking for a safer home for the children. I was brought a telegram, family ill, contagious illness, unsigned. I went to Vichy that very evening in my nurse's uniform and my identity card where the word Jew was not mentioned. I was seen by a top civil servant, and I can't tell you who he was, but he was French. He was in a beautiful office. And I, I told him about the tragedy at his year, and I said, Sir, if you can do something for these children, then do it. And he said, why are you looking after these filthy yids? Go away. I, I tried another official whose reaction was the same. He ended up shouting, get out of here or I will arrest you. I, I was not frightened. What was there to be frightened of when my husband, the children, Everything was, was broken up. Well, I am going to say to you, I am going to say, especially to Barbie's defense, that Barbie has always maintained that he was only concerned with the resistance workers and the Makizar, that is to say enemies of the German army. I ask the children, the 44 little children, what were they? Were they resistance fighters, Makizar? What were they? They were innocents. For this crime, that is here, there can be neither forgiveness nor for guessing. I began working at the easier settlement 
after I was no longer allowed to continue my medical studies because of the anti-Jewish laws. On April the 6th, when the bell sounded for breakfast, my sister went downstairs. I followed her. Halfway down, I saw three men in civilian clothing in the hallway. A small man in a raincoat and hat flanked by two larger men. The little man with the eyes said in good French, come down here, we need to talk to you. My sister made a sign to me, it's the Germans, get going. I ran back upstairs into the sick bay, I jumped out of the window and I hid under a bush. I heard the shouts and sobs of the children. I heard the soldiers shouting schnell. Yes, they are shouting schnell, schnell. Then there is the leaving for Leon and the children crying. After two days, we leave for Drancy. On the fourth day there, the soldiers are making a call of the children. My name is not on the list of the ones who are to leave. I have false papers, but I say, no, my name is not Marie-Louise de Coste. I am Lea Feldblum, and I leave in a in convoy of animal trucks. And after three days and three nights on the train, we arrive at Birkenau by night with 33 children. The SS with their dogs make us get down in fives. They tear me from the little Emil, three years old, who holds onto my skirt. They take them and burn them. I was deported on the 6th of May, 1943, but all my three sons were safely in the children's home at Isieux. I was in Auschwitz until 1945. One morning, I recognized my son Jacques among a group of children who just arrived. I couldn't get to him. He didn't see me. And then, sometime after that, a woman arrived in our block. She'd been deported with her 14-year-old son. One morning, I saw the boy, and he was wearing Jacques's pullover. I said to the mother, your son's wearing my boy's pullover. He must be dead. I, I went back inside and I prayed. I kept hoping that God had protected my son. That was not to be. It was not until after the liberation that I knew for certain that all my three sons had died in Auschwitz. Jacques was 13, Richard was eight, and Jean-Claude was six. Would you please identify this document? Yes. He sent me a letter for Mother's Day from Isier. It was given to me after the liberation. Now, Madame Mengigi has asked me to read this letter. It's from her son, Jack, her eldest son, Jack, and it's dated May the 30th, 1943. Dear Mama, I know how much you've been missing us. And on this Mother's Day, from far away, I send you all my love. I am doing all I can to make you pleased with me. And when you send me a parcel, I share it with the children who have lost their parents. I'll finish now. Lots of love, your son, Jack. I was at Easier as a children's helper. I looked after the little ones because I was the youngest, 
But the other staff looked after the older ones. At bedtime, I always had the one story for the girls. But the boys, going from bed to bed, I had to tell a different one to each. I told them all the stories I knew, and I, I always ended up with Emil, who was the most disturbed. He'd seen his parents dragged away. You left the house before the raid? I had to get back to school for the beginning of term. Monsieur le Président, Madame Pérez took many photographs of the children of his year, which are published in this book. May the jury see them, please. For me, the place was a haven of peace. They were kids who laughed and sang. It was like a summer camp. At that time, other children were there too, like my brother and sister. That's why I took the photos. The photos date from 1943. From the summer of 1943. And the witness confirms the authenticity of the published photographs for those she took at the time? Yes. Thank you. The final charge we come to concerns the rail convoy which left Lyon on the 11th of August 1944, containing some 600 to 650 persons, half Jews, half resistance. The register at Auschwitz records on the 22nd of August 1944, arrival of 308 persons originating from Montluc, Lyon. Now, a certain number of witnesses will testify to Barbie's presence at the roll call of Montluc and later at the station. The question of his awareness of the final destination of the deportees remains central. Could we have the first witness, please? Will you tell us your name, Christian name, age, profession, and address, please? Alice Jolly, married name, Van Steenberg. 78 years old, doctor of medicine, living in Velabam. Did you know the defendant before the events with which he is accused? Not at all. Have you any kinship with him? Thankfully, no. Make your statement, madame. I made the acquaintance of Barbie when I was arrested. I was taken to the Gestapo headquarters at Bellicor. It was August, and there was a fire in that rather grand fireplace in that bourgeois room on the fourth floor. Half an hour later, I had no fingernails. I don't want to talk too much about torture because that is not why I am here. When you join the resistance, you know the risks you are taking. But five of my vertebrae were broken. I was drowned. I was given the bath torture and I was used like a punch bag. That is why I have never been able to walk properly since. I was then confronted with my section chief, and in front of me they burnt the soles of his feet. That is why they had a fire in August. The 11th of August we were woken early. They cleared the cells quickly, brutally. I was left behind because I was not Jewish and through the ventilator in the door, I was able to witness one of Barbie's more playful habits. He gave the children back to their mothers so they could go together and be gassed at our wits. You saw Barbie? Yes, I saw Barbie on the 11th of August, a couple of hours before they left. The gentlemen of the Gestapo are not stingy about keeping people standing about. Are you sure? It was Barbie. I am not sure if it was Barbie or if it was Altman. <laughs> One day, Barbie came and fetched me, and in the corner of his office, I saw a piece of paper headed Convoy of August the 11th. I didn't know what it meant then. Madame Goudefin, when the roll call took place at the prison, are you sure that Barbie was present? Yes, I'm sure. He left before the lorries, but he was there. He called out the list. He completely mispronounced the names. And you were taken to Parash Station? Yes. The Gestapo were there and the French militia. When I saw Barbie, I said, he would be here, wouldn't he? They made me get on the train by beating me with coshes. And where were you deported to? 
Ravensbrück. I was arrested on the 28th of June, 1944, by two Germans and two Frenchmen. And I stress they weren't from the militia, but the Gestapo. Madame Ambre, what were the reasons for your arrest? I'd helped some Jewish friends. In the opinion of the witness, would the Germans responsible for the convoys know their final destination? Although the assembly points were in France and the convoys never left directly for Dachau or Ravensbrück, I cannot honestly believe that anyone in charge of the Gestapo in France didn't know the final destination of the convoys, even if they weren't going straight to Germany. Be seated. Can we please bring in the accused? I'm going to ask the police to be very alert. Now, people must keep their opinions to themselves or I will expel them. Can we please have Madame Franceschini? Good evening, madame. Would you please give your name, maiden name, age and address? Madame Julie Franceschini, 78 years old. I live in Arkeshaw. Did you know the accused before your encounter with him at Montluc? Or do you have any kinship with him? No, I swear it. We are listening. I was arrested on the 29th of February, 1944, at 11 o'clock at night. I'd come to Lyon to be married. They came to the hotel where we were staying and said, we want to talk to you. Barbie was there and another man. They took us in a large Citroen to Le Col de Santé Militaire, where we were separated. My fiancé was tortured and beaten. Then it was my turn. I had difficulty in seeing Barbie. The other man stuck my head into a bathtub of water so hard that I almost suffocated. I came out covered in blood and dirt. They dumped me in the cells until the following morning. Cell number 20, the one where Barbie is now. During the bathtub torture, was Barbie present? Yes, I heard him. He was a drunken orgy, he was drunk. I recognized him in 1972, when his photo was shown on television. Well, you haven't yet formally identified him? No. Yes, that's him. I can't forget those eyes. Accused, what have you to say? I have nothing to say. Monsieur le Procureur General. If you will allow me, I would like to ask Klaus Barbie a question, and I will tell him eventually why he must reply. Another Barbie in 1933, a Barbie who was serving his country, his nation, wanting to join the army. A Barbie who speaks movingly about the death of his father. How did this young man of 20, with normal reactions, become this die-hard SS officer, the man we know now? What happened between 1933 and 1937 in your life? In years to come, people will consult the testimonies made at this trial, and the one question they will all ask will be, had he nothing to say? Perhaps one of your grandchildren will go looking into his past, and he will say, did he really have nothing to say? I think it is today you must tell us what happened. From that young man aware of human misery to this convinced SS man. This question is the key to the trial. Will you reply today? Nothing to say. Will you call out the names of the defense witnesses, please? Madame Marguerite Duras, absent. 
Monsieur Paul Guijon. Present. Monsieur Edine Lachta to me. Present. Monsieur Regis Debray. Absent. Monsieur Raymond Aubrac. Present. Monsieur Yves Damion. Present. Monsieur Jacques Fast. Present. Usher, will you take the witnesses to the room reserved for them? And may I remind you that you must not talk to each other about the trial or the accused. Monsieur le Président, members of the jury, before we listen to these distinguished witnesses, let's look at the three forms of defense the accused has adopted so far. Firstly, under the expert guidance of his counsel, Barbie always says, no, it wasn't me, it was others. Next, he refuses to speak by absenting himself from the trial. When I said I would like to ask him questions about his life, he categorically refused. When experts are brought here and prove that Section 4 at Lyon was the Gestapo, the Barbie was its head, that he decided upon the deportations and knew their fate, apparently we shall be in another trial, the trial of the German authorities. And finally, you can't blame me. What about Algeria? Well, nevertheless, I remind myself that in France, we value the Human Rights Convention. And for that reason, I cannot oppose the hearing of witnesses called by the defense, though I say it more in resignation than through conviction. When making their final pleas, the prosecution and the defense can say what they wish, we admit it. And at that stage, Monsieur Vergès can talk of tortures in Algeria, Vietnam, and the Middle Ages, if you want. My wants. learned friends are anticipating But I am that. opposed to allowing any of these defense witnesses to speak because they will use the sufferings of our Jewish martyrs as an excuse for vile anti-colonialist propaganda. I agree with Monsieur le Procureur Général. It is wrong to limit the rights of the defense. Two days of witnesses are anticipated. The prosecution have taken much more. It would be quite wrong to proceed otherwise members of the jury we have heard more than 90 witnesses for the prosecution some have never seen Barbie did not know Lyon or even France oh, I made no objection to them being heard I haven't begun to speak yet you are told oh I don't believe him he is going to twist the debate he's going to introduce an Algerian they say beware Vergez he is going to speak last Beware, he is going to put France on trial. They're making you out to be idiots. And now, before any witness for the defense has been heard, they're proposing that they should be gagged. The court is exercising its discretionary powers and rules that all witnesses called by the defense will be heard. Have you any personal knowledge of the events concerning which Barbie is accused? From my reading. Monsieur Lecter, to me, I asked if you had any personal knowledge. No. Monsieur Vergers. Monsieur le President, we have heard many stories of crimes against humanity. Monsieur Lecter, to me, is the son of an Algerian father and a French mother. Uh, two of his uncles were deported to Dachau, so he could be appearing here as a witness for the party civil in an action against the Germans. However, I have asked him to appear because his father was killed in the Algerian war by the French. My father was in the resistance in Paris. He even killed a German officer. But during Algeria, he was arrested by the French army and murdered. I lodged a complaint, but it was rejected because of the amnesty that had been agreed after the end of the Algerian war. If there are crimes against humanity, they should be the same for everybody. Is Mr. Lachda Toomey saying that because the killer of his father has never been found or judged, or because of an amnesty that was granted for the sake of peace. That there should be an amnesty for Nazi crimes? For crimes committed against the resistance? For genocide? Take any resistance fighter. Why, if he's a Frenchman, can he pursue a charge of crimes against humanity against a German, but if he's an Algerian, he cannot against a Frenchman? You swear without hate or fear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Raise your right hand and say, I swear. I swear. Monsieur Fast's mother was arrested while in the resistance and an uncle deported. I want to ask him, as one who has served in the French army, what he thinks of crimes against humanity. Maître Vergès, be careful. I don't want to put the French army on trial. I have too much respect for our dead and also the Algerian dead. If but you come here to testify on actions taken in Algeria, do it in three words. I want to say to you, we did things 
as bad as anything done in the Second World War. I'm going to stop you there, Monsieur Fast. I'm going to rule the testimony on what the French army did or did not do in Algeria is irrelevant to this trial. The court apologizes to you that you've been asked to come all the way from Reunion Isle for no purpose. Thank you. Call the next witness. Here we have one of the many young Frenchmen who got it wrong. wrong. Quiet, please. Monsieur Damion joined the SS when he was 17. I think we ought to acknowledge his courage in coming here. He was tried and imprisoned in 1944 and released 10 years later. Which SS unit did you belong to? The information service. Monsieur Damion, when you were in Lyon, did you ever meet Barbie? No, sir. And in France, was the SS subordinate to the military? In a war zone, it is the military who are in control. Well, obviously, Barbie was not as all-powerful as has been made out by the 90 prosecution witnesses. In the SS, when a report is signed, is the person who signs it responsible for carrying out the action, or is he just signing a report? Well, he, he's, he's just making a report. He doesn't necessarily carry it out. During the war, how often did you return to France? Four times. And this was sufficient for you to understand the organization of the SS in France? Its structures? No. You weren't in the SS, were you, Monsieur Damion? I was a lieutenant. But you were arrested by the SS. Why should they arrest one of their own? There was a discrepancy of views, a suspicion I had not been alert enough. <laughs> Maitre Vegez. I left you with my detailed and argued conclusions yesterday, Monsieur le Président, so I will content myself with simply outlining them here, dealing as they do, members of the jury, with the distinct possibility that even if Klaus Barbie is found guilty of crimes against humanity, he must be allowed to step to immediate freedom once this trial is over. Now, point one. What we are dealing with here is a legal principle called the absorption of sentences which provides that when an accused person is successfully convicted of several crimes, only the severest sentence passed for any of those crimes, and it alone, applies to them all, provided that the crimes were committed before the first sentence was carried out. Second point. Now, you'll see, members of the jury, how this applies in the case of Barbie. Twice, in 1952 and in 1954, French courts sentenced him to death in his absence for war crimes. So whatever sentence might be passed here in Lyon, it will be absorbed by those death penalties. Third point. Ah, but you'll say, those death penalties were never carried out. And the death penalty itself was abolished in 1981. Well, here, members of the jury, I wish to refer you to a judgment of the French Court of Appeal of December 1958, which brings into play a second principle, the statute of limitation which lays down that a sentence passed but never carried out is deemed indeed to have been carried out after 20 years. Well, so you see, members of the jury, after 1972 and 1974, Barbie was legally considered executed, a sentence which absorbs all others. Now, uh, members of the jury, I have brought these conclusions forward from their natural place at the end of the trial. Now, why? Well, so that you can have time to ponder them. And so that I can never be accused of springing surprises. <laughs> Monsieur le Président, Maître Vergès has clearly described a possible situation. I do not intend to enter into the debate today, as there is a logical procedure to respect. We will now hear the final submissions from the Parti Civile. Maître Klaasfeld, we are listening. During the 21 months he spent in this city, Klaus Barbie became known as the Butcher of Lyon. In 1980 he said he always believed in God. And yet he chose to become part of the SS. Now did he know the difference between good and evil. Well, I think he did. He made a choice. 
and as head of the Gestapo, willingly perpetrated acts of horror and cruelty that went far beyond anything even his superiors had demanded of him. In April 1944, just four months before the liberation, the Lyon Provincial Gestapo was the only group still rounding up victims for the death trains, an act at which Barbie excelled. He was the first to attack a Jewish children's home. And when he disposed of the children of his year, neither the Berlin SS nor the Paris SS had directed him to do so. I was a child like those at his year. They could have been my classmates. Had it not been for a cupboard with a, with a false back, I would have joined my father at Auschwitz at the age of eight. Since 1971, I have thought of nothing but those children who, saved by the devotion of Madame Zlatan, were then, through Barbie's hatred, deported by Drancy to their assassination in the East. I think of Sammy Adelsheimer, just five years old. Sammy never came back. I think of Max Lerner, seven years old. Max never came back. I think of Otto Wertheimer, 12 years old. Otto never came back. I think of Egon In 1964, Gamiel. the French Nazi, Polk, said, Barbie was in every way the leading light of all the missions. He was the powerhouse. Barbie was a political policeman, not a soldier. When on the 11th of August, he knew he had to empty the prisons and had 650 people to dispose of, he packed them into one train. But he'd already done his sorting. Jews had to be exterminated. So they were put in the first two wagons, men in the first, women in the second. Female resistance were put in the third, and then the men. He had already selected those destined to die. Look at these heaps of bodies. Look, and never forget, in the camps, there were doctors, high-ranking officers. Well-known industrialists used this manpower, and they all knew that within a few days, these people would disappear. Monsieur le Président, members of the jury, Crime against humanity implies, above all, a plunge into inhumanity. We have all made that plunge over the last few weeks, as we have heard men and women courageously stating in public what they had known, and in some cases never dared utter. I will not talk about their evidence. I do not have the words. But my silence only means respect and compassion. You, the jury, will give them the justice which Barbie refused. What happened in the camps, whether to Jew or resistant, is now defined by the Court of Appeal as a crime against humanity. For me, as a man and a citizen, inhumanity is always unacceptable and must be repressed. But what must be proved is that Barbie, in deporting Jew or resistant, knew he was sending them to their death. Barbie totally subscribed to Hitler's theory of racial superiority, a creed whose logical end was the final solution, and that sense of superiority permeated everything he did. For him, others did not exist, even children. As head of Section 4 of the Gestapo in Lyon, Barbie was answerable to no one. His power came from Hitler. As colleagues said of him, he was a real sadist, Barbie was the real head of our service. He helped with the torture, he shot people. Now, Barbie claims he only busied himself with the resistance. But when Madame Lagrange, as a Jewish child, her mother and father already arrested, is beaten by Barbie to find out where her brother and sister are, is that Barbie not occupying himself with Jews? Barbie is a congenital liar. But how did he control Lyon? 
by denunciation, bribery, spying, interrogation, torture, and deportation. Knochen, his parish chief, has said it was the role of Section 4 to decide on deportations. Now, where you are going is worse than death, was said to Jew and resistant alike. Now, despite the signature on the UGIF report and the Isior Telex, and despite his personally subdividing the convoy on the 11th of August, Barbie still maintains what happened was the responsibility of the transport section. Barbie was directly responsible for 842 deportations to death camps, including 52 children. What a size court has had to judge anything worse than that. On the 11th of August, 1944, Barbie deported a boy the same age as his son and a girl a little younger than his own daughter. It meant nothing to him. I ask you to condemn him to life imprisonment. Maître Vegez. Monsieur le Président, members of the jury, first of all, on behalf of the defense, I wish to pay tribute to the resistance. I also wish to pay homage to the sufferings of the Jews and the Gypsies, because we of the defense know what racism is. In June 1940, 200 Senegalese soldiers of the French army were massacred by the Germans simply because they were black. Now, why is it? Why is it that crimes against humanity only merit attention when the victims are Europeans? Mr. President, with your permission, I wish to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Member, a member of the Bard Brazzaville, a symbolic defense. In this, a symbolic trial. Monsieur le Président, in my country, when the French were constructing the Congolese railway in the 1930s, black men, hundreds at a time, were taken to Brazzaville, forced to walk 500 kilometers without food, to dig out tunnels with pigs. Exhausted, like skeletons, they died en masse. Husbands, brothers, sons, they never came back. They knew that the railways meant death. And 17,000 of them died within the first 140 kilometers. That was a crime against humanity. After what the French did there, let us make no distinction between lesser and greater crimes. I ask you, do you feel you can judge Klaus Barbie with a clear conscience? Monsieur le Président, I'm going to ask something exceptional of French justice. Humanity with a capital H. By what mental alchemy can one stay silent in the face of Israeli butchers vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people, yet shout against Nazi crimes? Monsieur le Président, How can one describe the actions of the Israeli authorities in any other way than incitement to genocide in encouraging the massacres at the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps in the Lebanon when they could have avoided or even stopped them? Monsieur le Président, my colleague for the defense has I have not given you permission to speak. Sit down. Thank you, Monsieur le Président. I'm going to finish. In memory of all our dead, would you please add to your verdict the words, to the shroud of the children of Ezio, we add those of Soweto, of Sabra and Chatilla, from the people of France, in all humility. Thank you, Maitre Boueta. You may now speak. We've just heard the defense compare the crimes of Sabra and Shatila with Nazi crimes. It is absolutely intolerable to have to listen to such a recital in a trial which is supposed to be considering crimes against humanity committed by a Nazi. The jury are the judges in an assize court, not Barbie's accusers. It is wrong that every time the defense produces an argument, the party civil attack it. 
Silence! Well, I will empty the court. Mitra Vejas, you may ask me. Monsieur le Président, members of the jury, the time has come at last for the defense to explain the case in front of you. Now, please be patient. Whereas others have had two weeks to plead their case, I have two and a half days. And I trust I still have the right not to be interrupted. UGIF, the General Union of French Jews. In dealing with this issue, the prosecution has glossed over the truth. Even if the role of certain Jews between the years 1941 and 1944 is a somewhat delicate matter, it must be broached. The Jewish resistance considered the UGIF as an organization of collaborators set up by the Vichy government in order to make lists of the poorer foreign Jews, and it was these lists which were used for deportation. This Nazi-sponsored official organization was financed by the Jewish community and it was never short of money. The raid of the 9th of February 1943 was no more than a police operation aimed at trapping refugees with false papers, the kind of raid that takes place all over France today. What happened afterwards to those caught was the responsibility of the Vichy government and the German authorities in Paris. The uh, only witness to Barbie's presence at the UJF was given by Michel Thomas, this American who arrived here in his wig and makeup, <laughs> claiming to have been cross-examined by Barbie for an hour and a half in a crowded room, and yet he could remember nobody there. And as with the UGIF, so it is with the ISIU. No reliable eyewitness testimony exists that can place Klaus Barbie at ISIU on the day of the raid. We are therefore left with the contested testimony of the Isia Telex, which is so miraculously appeared. Testimony which would appear to be in conflict with the evidence given in Maitre Klaasfeld's book, The Children of Isia. Now, in order to establish the truth, I, I want you to examine the two copies which are found in that book. Now, if you turn to page 92, and to page 95, you will see that there are two versions of that telex, both different, both signed by Barbie, both sent from Lyon on the 6th of April, 1944. Now, Metro presents the telex on page 92 as the true one. And you will note that between the body of the text and the signature, there is a space. Yet, if we turn back to the page 95 telex, you will see that this space has magically disappeared. Now, what could have been in that space, I wonder? Well, could it be that a, a forger had stripped out part of the telex, containing, for example, the signature of Barbie Superior? That a heinous crime was committed at Isio, we all agree, but that it was committed by Barney is where we differ. Now, when we consider the convoy of 11th of August 1944, we see that no documentary proof exists whatsoever of Barney's involvement. We are asked to rely entirely upon memory and its fallible nature. Have any two witnesses been able to agree on the train that they traveled on, whether there was room or not, to which station they left from, how long the journey took place, or even what Barbie was supposed to have been wearing. Now, we come to the case, cases of individual torture. The people have suffered atrociously, no argument, yet, as with the witnesses to the convoy, I doubt whether 43 years after the event, that testimony is in any way reliable. 
Members of the jury, I say this not to mock the witnesses, but to point out that after so many years, memories, they become blurred. They get tangled up. And surely it would be wrong to condemn a man on such testimony. Wrong for justice. Wrong for France. Monsieur le President, members of the jury, this has been an exceptional trial. We have had to search for the truth in all this fog. <laughs> French history has taken some strange turns, but I doubt whether any of our judges has ever had to judge a man 43 years after the event. Since when evil has changed its uniform? And surely now it is time to liberate France from these Hitlerian ghosts. Now please, take care. Consider. If crimes against humanity apply only in some parts of the world, they run the risk of becoming a mere propaganda device, whereby the victors usurp all human values. Well. It is in the name of humanity that I ask you to say no. Members of the jury, in the name of justice of France and humanity, I ask you to acquit Klaus Barbie. Remain standing, if you please. In a few moments, the court and the jury will retire to consider their verdict. You now have the chance to say anything you consider relevant. Have you anything to say? Monsieur le Président, just a few words. I did not carry out the raid at Isla. I never had the power to decide on deportations. I fought the resistance, which I respected as hard as I could, but it was the war and the war is over. Thank you. Klaus Barbie, having been found guilty on all counts and there being no extenuating circumstances, you are condemned to life imprisonment in order to pay symbolic costs. Silence, if you please. Klaus Barbie, you have five days in which to appeal to the Supreme Court, after which period no appeal will be considered. Members of the jury, you are relieved of your duties. The court thanks you. All stand.